Good morning, Northern New Mexico. You're listening to Live at Northern, your community radio show from Northern New Mexico College. I'm your host, Stephanie Montoya. And whether you're just tuning in or are a returning listener, we just wanted to let our listeners know our program is on every alternating Wednesday from 9.05 to 9.50 a.m. And this is our time to share what's new at Northern, celebrate our students, faculty, and staff, and help the community get to know your local college. This is midterms week for Northern students, and I see a lot of students hitting the books in the library and taking advantage of tutoring and study sessions. But midterms is also a time for students to come together. Student life activities and student senate have been giving out snacks and coffee in the mornings and afternoons. So lots of love and support for our students as you complete tests and projects this week. And then it's spring break next week. We have a great show for you today. President Bailey will be joining us to talk about what's been happening and what is up and coming at Northern. And in honor of Women's History Month, Dr. Patricia Trujillo with Northern's Office of Equity and Diversity will share information about upcoming events and women's history here in New Mexico. And finally, we'll learn about STEM Corps, a new initiative at Northern designed to help students pursuing degrees in science, technology, engineering, and math. Plus, at the end of the hour, more news, events, and a giveaway if we have time. If not, we'll go ahead and move that to Facebook. So please stay tuned. Joining me this morning is a very familiar face and voice to many of you out there listening. Northern New Mexico College President Rick Bailey, thank you for joining us this morning on Live at Northern. Good morning, Stephanie. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. President Bailey, I know that a lot has happened at Northern and in the community since you were last on the air with us in November. Can you share with our listeners what has been happening at Northern from your perspective? Absolutely. So good morning to all the listeners at KDC. Uh, Very, very happy to be here. It's been a really exciting few months. Let me start with something most recent. So I had the the really wonderful pleasure yesterday of being with one of our students. His name is Reyes Royball. And we were at a waste management symposia where he was awarded an $8,000 scholarship. Uh, and when you when you hear his story, he got his GED when he was in his 30s. Um, He is a single father to a wonderful eight-year-old girl, and he he is now 14 months away from getting a bachelor's degree with us in environmental uh, environmental, uh, science. And I'll tell you what, and he's just an amazing, amazing young person. Everyone's a young person to me now, but um, (laughs) but being a part of that and just, I was was prouder than I could say, and um, and what an inspiration for all of us. So, uh, So that was just yesterday. We have had a great few months. Uh, we And I know there's a lot to talk about. Well, I, I definitely want to talk about our community college and the, the initiatives we have there. Um, we're going to talk about the changes that we've made and some of the improvements that we've made in student services. Uh, I can give a recap of the legislative session. So that was a big, fast 30-day session here. And then we've made some really big strides in philanthropy over the last couple of months. So it's been a really exciting uh, recent few months here. Well, you definitely hit all the highlights that I was <laughs> that I was hoping uh, you would, and there is certainly much to celebrate looking back uh, at the past year and even just the past few months from our Mill Levy election to the construction of the Solar Array in El Rito, which is just about to have its grand opening. Uh, is there anything you would like to, to highlight? Absolutely. So let's let's talk about the community college initiative. So for for the listeners out there, and I think I think we've discussed this before, but just a recap. All of this started in 2019 at that legislative session last year, and we had this crazy idea to establish a co-located community college branch at Northern. It would be the first of its kind uh, in the history of, of the state of New Mexico. And so that led to a Senate bill sponsored by uh, our wonderful Richard Martinez and the, the late Carlos Cisneros. That bill passed the Senate by a vote of 38 to 0 and then passed the House by a vote of 63 to 0. So it was unanimous in both houses. Uh, Democrats and Republicans all supported it, which was wonderful. Uh, Then the governor signed that into law in April. We then met with five school districts, Española, Pohuaque, Mesa Vista, Chama, and Hemis Mountain, and talked to all of their school boards. And then a combined vote of 21 and 1, they agreed to come together to form that community college district. That led to a mill levy election that I know the KDC listeners are familiar with because we were really, really pushing it. And with over 62% of the vote in November, 
the community overwhelmingly supported this initiative, and I, I we're incredibly grateful for the support we have. I do want to say a special thanks um, to three people who I think made that mill levy possible. Uh, one is Leo Valdez. Uh, so many of you know him. He is a uh, an alumni from the school in El Rito, and he was uh, right side by side with us. Um, the other is our our creative director for communications and marketing, Sandy Krolik, um, and our very own host of Live at Northern, Stephanie Montoya. It was really those three people, in my opinion, who who really made the difference in in getting this mill levy awareness campaign out and and really is setting the the table for the future of not just El Rito but the future of career technical education in the in the valley. So it was a really big deal for us. Um, the let's talk about the timeline really quick. We are on track to start two programs. We have to be careful now not to advertise them, but our plan is to start a plumber's program and an electrician program in the fall of 2020, we're waiting on one final approval from the Higher Learning Commission for our plumbers program. At that point, then we will be able to, to advertise that. Uh, the, we will start with the theoretical classes, uh, more than likely either on our Española campus or through Zoom or online starting this fall. And then starting in January of 2021, the, the hands-on classes, the lab classes for both the plumbers and the electricians will be on our El Rito campus. And then you also brought up the solar array. Uh, really excited about this. This was a two-year project, and it went operational on December 20th. So not only is the college going to save in terms of electricity uh, for the 1.5 megawatt solar array, but everyone in the village of El Rito who's connected to Kit Carson, they're going to see their rates go down too. Well, that's, you know, really exciting. I remember being there for the um, groundbreaking. I think we might have an emergency alert test happening in okay. the background. Or, okay, finished. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I remember being at the groundbreaking, uh, you know, last year and now to see that that has gone up. Um, and that's really exciting. And I understand that we do uh, have an event planned kind of around that. We do. Yeah. So that is coming on March 23rd. Uh, one of the big events that we're planning, it's a huge day in El Rito. So we're starting at one o'clock with a Board of Regents meeting. So we try to every every quarter to have our Board of Regents up on our El Rito campus. So that'll be at one o'clock on Monday, March 23rd. That'll be followed by the ribbon cutting for our solar array at four o'clock. And then at 5.30, we will have a community dinner hosted uh, and sponsored by El Farolito, which is our wonderful restaurant in El Rito. And then at 7 o'clock, we'll have the grand reopening of the El Rito Observatory. Uh, so we have all, all you backyard astronomers out there who uh, are interested. Our goal with that observatory is we wanted to give access to it for free to every public school class that wanted it. And so in order to do that, we're going to have a cadre of operators that are going to be trained, these backyard astronomers, and they'll be working with uh, school teachers so that anyone who wants to set up a, uh, a visit, um, the operator will be there to assist the educator in bringing their students to the observatory. So that, all that's happening on March 23rd. And we'll be sure to put out um, a flyer and some more information on social media and on our website. And, you know, I think you'll see them out in the community as well. We're calling it the sun and the stars party. Love it. Love it. Yes. <laughs> so it's a great event for the community. Uh, for the past couple of months, though, I know that a big draw on your and all of our attention really was a legislative session. And even the governor, as far as I know, has not finalized the budget as of yet. Is there anything you can tell our listeners about how things are looking for Northern and our community here in Española? Yeah, absolutely, Stephanie. So so tomorrow is the governor's deadline to sign the budget. So we, we will hear literally within the next day uh, where we're going with this. But I do want to be cautious, and, and I know the governor is being cautious. For those of you who are paying attention to developments internationally, uh, there is an oil... Uh, conflict, I don't know how else to say it, between Saudi Arabia and Russia right now, and that is having uh, an effect on oil prices globally, and so that actually could affect New Mexico's economy. So the governor, rightly so, is is paying close attention to that and looking at some things that we, we may need to do to, to curb the budget. So all of this is in flux. I will say, that aside... Uh, it was a really good year for Northern, and we're looking at the possibility, and all of this is going to be discussed with our with our union partners, 
but I feel strongly that we're going to be able to give compensation increases to 99% of our faculty and staff for the third year in a row after a decade without. Um, I am confident that we will likely not petition the Board of Regents for an overall tuition increase because we don't want to put this on the backs of our students. That will be the third year in a row that we've kept tuition steady. And I'm pretty sure we're the only college in the state that has done that uh, because of who we serve and because we, we're, we want to make sure that we're very sensitive about every dollar. Um, and uh, so we also have a little bit of new funding, new operational ING funding, uh, instruction and general funding. Uh, we may be looking at an increase in our nursing enhancement funds, which actually will help our nursing program in a really, really important way and stabilize the, the, the nursing faculty that we have. Uh, so all in all, it was, a, it was a really, really big year. The last big piece, and again, this is still in flux, is the possibility of an opportunity scholarship, and that's something that the governor has been pushing. That could lead to Northern students, many Northern students, who get their tuition and fees paid for completely um, by the state and still be able to apply for Pell Grant after that. That would be a game changer for Northern. So we're working very closely with the higher education department on that. Uh, let me finish with this. Um, I've been here three and a half years now, and the governor has really made higher education a priority in this state and for the, for the first time since I've been here. And it is really, really good, not just for Northern. It's good for the state of New Mexico that we are recognizing the importance of higher education for the economic diversity that we need in the future in this state, for business, for everything else that we need to do. Uh, higher education plays a really important role. And we are partners side by side with early childhood, K-12, and everything else, workforce development. So, uh, I, so I'm really, really optimistic about the future. I know that as a public college, it's always um, so critical for us to be able to get the funding from the state, especially since our tuition is so low and we've kept it so low. And, right. you know, because of the population that we do serve and, you know, the, the needs that our students have. But speaking of that, I know that one thing that is up and coming at Northern is an important resource for students and their families, a food pantry. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking, Stephanie. So, we, we gave a survey out to our students about a year and a half ago, and I remember at the time telling the students, hey, we're going to ask some really personal questions on this, but I think the college is really looking at how we think of student services more holistically, and so it's not just what happens in the classroom. It's all the other support services that we give to students when they're outside the classroom, and to the students' credit, and I, I really am very grateful to them for this, they did not hold back. They did exactly what I asked them to do. They took the gloves off, and they really shared some of the personal challenges that they were, that they were facing. One of them is food insecurity. And if we as educators don't think that students who are living on one meal a day, if we, if we don't think that might affect their ability to, to succeed in the classroom, then we're, then we're, not, then we're missing out. Um, so, and I will say this is a credit to our faculty. Our faculty understand that, completely understand that. And so we all came together. I do want to say a very, very special thanks to Gwen Orona, who is in our uh, Office of Advisement. She has really been a champion. And, you know, uh, someone else I'd like to recognize is Tamara Trujillo, um, who is now working for the State um, uh, Office of Personnel. And um, we've really had some champions who have, who have fought for this, and now it is becoming a reality. Uh, this is going to be a student-run enterprise where all students will have to do is show a current um, student ID card. There's no application. They will get a reusable shopping bag, and they're from uh, almost like a supermarket, they're going to be able to fill up that bag with whatever they want. That food pantry is going to be open for students. Right now, it's, it's going to be – it's going to start – Every Thursday afternoon, I think from 3 to 5. Uh, Gwen will have to correct me on that. That sounds right. I think I heard the same. And that is starting on March 26th, uh, so we're going to have a grand opening for that. And th the bottom line is Northern is, is cultivating uh, and embracing uh, a culture of caring. And, so the, and this is not just on us. It's not just on faculty and staff. It's not just on the students. We need, as a community, we need to make sure that our students at Northern – know that it's okay to get help. And, and the more we do that and the more we destigmatize that,
the better. I know it's easier said than done, but that's what we're fighting for. And I know that the Food Depot is um, going to be a provider for that food pantry. And then in addition to it being a food pantry, I know that um, there's a vision for a clothing closet, specifically a professional dress clothing closet yes. for, for students preparing for interviews or internships and then other supplies, including feminine products, diapers. We might yeah. be putting a call out to community in the future to help us with that. Absolutely. No, thanks for saying that. Yeah, so we are going to have a clothing closet. It's in the same space. Uh, special thanks to Hemes House. They actually donated the uh, the racks that we're using for that. We've already had a bunch of people who are interested in in bringing clothes. We we would ask for those who are who are interested that they are serviceable, clean, professional clothes. But I will say that in the future, um, p- perhaps this fall, we'll also look at connect collecting coats for kids. Um, we have a lot of parents, uh, students who are parents and whose kids could use coats for the winter. So we'll look at those things. I'm glad you also brought up the idea of toiletries, feminine hyg- hygiene products, diapers, baby food, all of that will be part of this food pantry. We we looked a lot to Amarillo College. They've been one of our, one of our models for how we set this up. And at Amarillo College, feminine hygiene products were the number one most requested item. So we need to be sensitive to, to what our students need and make sure that we're stocking those shelves with things that the students actually can use. One thing that I think is great about the the location of the food pantry and clothing closet is that it is adjacent to kind of a, a new hub of activity on campus. We have some new and revamped spaces that are already being used by students, staff, and community. Can you tell us about those? Sure, yeah. So we have a new uh, Northern New Mexico College Event Center. Uh, it's really where we do our convocation. It's where we can have large groups. It's also a community space that we can we can bring in community groups uh, who want to use that space. We have a, a completely new Veterans Resource Center. Uh, I do want to say a special thanks to Rudy Cidabaca. He was our former coordinator. He had a vision for creating really a USO type atmosphere for our veteran students. We've doubled the number of veteran students that we have at Northern in the last few years. Uh, and our new uh, coordinator, Mike Rivera, he's, he has picked up the mantle. He's really made that a very welcoming space. And then we also um, listened to our students. The students told us that they wanted a space that was all their own. They didn't want to coordinate for use of, of public spaces around campus. So we actually dedicated a part of that space downstairs to students. So the student senate office is down there. There is a student lounge area, and there's a conference room in there where student clubs can coordinate through their own student leadership to use that without me or anyone else getting in their way. So uh, it's really it's really become a, a multi-use space. We're really excited about it. I know that the food pantry and, and the other student success initiatives uh, will be supported by funding from community donors to the new President's Eagle Fund. Uh, what is this fund, and how can donors get involved? Yeah, this all came about because we are in a transition period with the foundation. The foundation is alive and well, and it is going really strong, but we made the the operational decision to allow the foundation funding to, to grow while we explore kind of the future for that. And in the meantime, what we did is the college, and I want to give credit to our Board of Regents, the college set aside money for student scholarships. So last year, we gave out $125,000 in scholarships, and using this new technique, it was more than we had given in the history of the of the college and the foundation. So we're really excited about that. Then on the other side, while the foundation is growing, we decided, well, let's raise money for college operational programming, like the food pantry and clothing closet. And so we have had a lot of donors who have done some amazing work. Uh, our And we created a special fund, the President's Eagle Fund, to really help with direct student support operational programming, like the food pantry. Our lead gift for that came from N3B, one of our local partners. They gave us $100,000 to start that uh, that fund. And for those who are interested, and I, let me say N3B is one of many. There are so many different community partners who have contributed to that fund. Uh, and so things are looking really good. I do want to say that uh, we do have a major gifts officer. Her name is Judith Pepper, and she is wonderful. And if you're interested in donating to the President's Eagle Fund or finding mo- out more about it, Uh, Her office number is 505-747-2129. Well, definitely a lot of exciting um, possibilities and opportunities for things going forward. And uh, in light of that, what are your goals for the upcoming year? What can we look forward to? I think there's a couple of things that, that, and these are going to be challenges, but I really want to look at 
we're growing, enrollment's up, all of those things are good. What we really want to do is make sure that we have more and more students who are getting to their educational goals. And so student services, student support, student performance, what are the things that we can do institutionally that put them in, in a better place in terms of chances to succeed? Part of that is to make student services more holistic, like we talked about, so food pantry. I think we need to address housing insecurity. I think we need to do more and more um, uh, mental health counseling, behavioral health counseling, all of those things that we're doing uh, a great job on now. I want to make sure that those are readily available. We want to explore uh, child care opportunities. So we're looking at partnerships with Rio Reba Adult Literacy and some uh, McCurdy Ministries and some other wonderful partners who may help us come together so that we actually share resources. Uh, I want to explore the idea of different scheduling. So rather than what is most convenient for the institution or more or most convenient for our staff, I want to look at what's most convenient for our students and where they are right now. Um, and to include the idea of moving some courses to eight-week schedules, which, which we have it, statistics show that first-generation students, students of color, are, uh, uh, there are a lot of students who statistically are benefiting from different models that I think we should explore. And then lastly, we're working on a project called Upstart, and Upstart is, is a, a, a program that will allow low-income students more access to federal and state aid. If you take Upstart plus the Pell Grant, plus the Governor's Opportunity Scholarship, we can dramatically change the fiscal picture for students in the Valley. And since you did mention holistic support for students, a big part of that is student health and and campus health. Um, And because it is on everyone's mind these days, um, can you offer some insight about the coronavirus and what Northern is doing to respond? No, I appreciate the question, Stephanie. So so let me me start by saying that, that Northern takes the coronavirus coronavirus and the threat of the coronavirus incredibly seriously. We have been following guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and our own State Department of Health. Uh, we've also been coordinating with fellow institutions. So we've, we've been looking at what University of New Mexico is doing um, and its branch campuses and others. We have uh, instituted travel restrictions for our faculty, staff, and students. Unfortunately, we've had to cut a few trips, but we've done that in the interest of safety. Um, We're handling exceptions on a case-by-case basis. Uh, We've asked our assistant provost, um, Dr. Don Apiarias, he is going to head up a task force to look at some recommendations for that. And we're minimizing, looking at minimizing the footprint on both of our campuses, and that's students, faculty, and staff. Um, And looking at the possibility of moving some or most of our coursework online, or at least providing an online or a Zoom or a Skype option. I do want to say a special thanks to our Office of Equity and Diversity. That same survey I talked about where students were talking about their food insecurity, there's also um, 21, 22% of our students who do not have access to internet at home. So we have to be really sensitive about what we're going to do institutionally to make sure that those students still have, um, that we're mindful of equity as we make these uh, transitions. And, and we'll work closely with Dr. Trujillo and Equity and Diversity to make sure that whatever we institute um, doesn't disadvantages uh, disadvantage some students over others. And of course, we'll post any updates. We'll send them to students and staff via email, but also on the homepage of our website under news, we've put um, extensive information about yes. what we know as of now, some precautions that we can all take, which is just good practice for, for any type of infectious disease, you know, washing your hands, cleaning surfaces, staying away from people who are sick, staying home if you are sick. Um, so that is on the homepage of our website. And if there any updates, we'll be sure to share those as well. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. And yeah, if you go to our website right now, there's already some guidance on there. Let, let's just also throw it out there to all KDSA listeners out there. Um, this is a really serious issue, and we need to treat it really seriously. I, I, you know, you hear the stories about we need to wash hands, we need to limit contact. Um, I will tell you this, I'll confess this, I'm a hugger. So I've, I really have to be mindful of mm-hmm. that and, um, and respectful of that. So we just need to get through this together as a community and do everything we can to minimize um, the risk. Because I'll, I'll say this, 
you know, we, we don't have any confirmed cases in New Mexico, but we've done so very little testing in New Mexico that I think there is a likelihood that, that it's not if, it's when. It's when we're going to have this threat, and we need to be, as a community, proactive about how we deal with it. Absolutely. And I think on the other end of that, it's also important not to panic. I know people are clearing out the shelves right, with right. toilet paper and things like that. So, you know, I would say maybe just try to strike a balance between what makes sense. Right. <laughs> My dad went out to the supermarket yesterday and basically bought a bunch of wine. I'm like, why, why, why is wine the thing that you need to get through this? So, yeah, we all need to make sure that we're being we, we don't want to raise panic. Um, but at the same time, we do want to be cautious and we want to be courteous about our, our fellow community members. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me this morning, Dr. Rick Bailey, president of Northern New Mexico College. We look forward to having you back on the show again soon. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. And as things solidify with the state budget, with other announcements, news and events um, that Dr. Bailey mentioned today, we will be sure to get those announcements out uh, via our social media, via our website and to the media as we are able. Um, STEM Corps is a new support program at Northern designed to help students pursuing degrees in science, technology, engineering, and math. Joining me to tell us more is engineering faculty, Dr. Steve Cox. Good morning. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, Katie. Sue. So um, I know you've been on the show before. <laughs> uh, you're always very involved with helping students, hands-on projects, not only at the college, but in the community, also in Dixon, um, where you live. And so um, just in case our listeners haven't gotten the chance to, to know you, uh, what is your background? And can you just tell us a little bit about what you do at Northern? Sure, sure. Thanks. Um, background. Yeah. So I've been I'm in academia for 35 years. I was, I've been a professor of mathematics, a professor of neuroscience. And um, for the past four years, I've been a professor of engineering at, at Northern, devoted largely to, to planting really smart, caring role models from Northern in K-12 to try to grow kids' kind of STEM curiosity. I love that. And curiosity is definitely a really important part of, of STEM. And mm. I think sometimes people hear that term STEM and it can be intimidating. Yeah. But I understand that STEM core um, is, is something that we now have in place um, at Northern that is designed to help those students. And so what is STEM core? Exactly. Yeah. So I'm super excited by this opportunity. So STEM core is one of five alliances created by the National Science Foundation to diversify our STEM workforce. Um, our listeners may have uh, may have seen hidden figures when the baby boomers entered the STEM workforce in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, there were not easy pathways for women and people of color, so those those barriers have essentially come down. But we still have a, a lot of work to replace those aging boomers. Right? We need a local diverse workforce. The lab in the hill is hiring a thousand people a year for the next five years. Um, so STEM Corps is this alliance, it's a partnership between 40 colleges and 40 labs. Each of those colleges is within 40 miles of a lab trying to create a sustained pipeline. There's been a lot of ad hoc work about kind of you know, recruiting some students into STEM, hiring some of those. There's a large bureaucracy at the lab, at all of the labs. There's a large government bureaucracy. So STEM Corps is a, is a way... To, to navigate incoming students at Northern into a cohort that's taking similar STEM courses and that's being groomed and, and scouted and encouraged and nurtured by lab members to enter internships to learn about the structure of the lab while they're still students at Northern. So it is kind of to speak to Dr. Bailey's notion about kind of holistic services, student services, it's really providing a navigator. And in this case, it's Melanie Cordova is the, is the navigator being funded by the lab itself to help our students um, navigate the, the, the STEM degree plan and also navigate entry into the lab. And we're doing this, and this is what's historic about it, we're doing this from day one. We're not kind of cherry picking just the, the, just the cream of the crop, the best students that kind of sailed through the program. I mean, that, the, those, those students, they need our help. They're, they're, they're important. But we really need to provide un entry-level encouragement. STEM is a, is a hard path, especially for students with, with poor preparation in mathematics and science. Yeah, and I just, this is, just to add to that, one of the things that, and I'm glad that Dr. Cox mentioned this, so, so Triad um, gave us the funding to help kind of bring this thing to life, the STEM core to life. We recently 
uh, our chair of our engineering department, uh, Dr. Sadi Ahmed, and uh, Dr. Lopez, our provost, and I were, were driving up the hill for a meeting at Los Alamos. And I, I asked Sadi, I said, hey, uh, you know, of your 102 students roughly in, in engineering, how many of them, if they could, how many of them would go work up at Los Alamos at the lab? And without, without hesitation, she said 99. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. 99, our students really want to work up there. I think the, the great work that Steve is doing is there is a, in, the lab has its own culture. It has its own, it, it's, it's, its own personality in mm-hmm. some ways. And so I think one of the things that Steve is, and, and Melanie are doing is, is really bridging the, the, the cultural divide between, between the Valley and that organization and really um, illuminating pathways that will make it easier for for our community members, our students to go up there, which is exactly what they want to do. I think you hit on something key there because a lot of times I think people see Los Alamos and Española as two separate communities. But when you look at the composition of the workforce up in Los Alamos, it's it's clear that, you know, a, a good number, I would say, you know, even close to a majority of those working up there are actually from the Española Valley. So yeah. it's it's really kind of this this two city uh, commuter, um, sh- you know, shared community relationship. And so Absolutely. the fact that we're bringing that to our students um, is is really important. And so, what benefits does the STEM Core program provide students? Yeah, so I guess that. And the abstract is kind of a, it's a pathway. It's really, it's a, it's a way for them to see themselves as bridging these cultures. And so that's, that's, the, that's maybe kind of a squishy talk, soft. It's what, 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 what's bridge really look like? <laughs> so the bridge looks like um, a fairly intrusive navigator in Melanie, someone that is really looking after our students each week to keep them online academically, to prepare them for meetings with the lab, to prepare them for, to create resumes for the lab, um, to prepare them for research opportunities, to find the other funding opportunities. So she's a connector. So she's, the bridge isn't just some kind of pie in the sky thing that we're, that these academics are planning. We've got a, we've got a navigator on the ground helping build a cohort. So helping these students build a STEM identity to see themselves as future kind of creators and contributors to the STEM workforce. You've certainly spoken to the demand for STEM degrees Mm -hmm. and STEM careers, the fact that STEM is a big component of the jobs of the future. Um, But I understand, you know, the math, the science, some of the classes, especially the, the core foundational classes that students have to pass in order to pursue these degrees can can be challenging. Um, and so what are some of the main challenges that students pursuing STEM degrees face and how can they overcome them? Right, right. That's a, that's a great question. So, I mean, I'm a first generation student myself. I struggled with, with uh, I failed a couple of math classes on the way. And, um, you know, that kind of, that upset me and decided, decided on me that I was going to actually dig even deeper. And so I watched that happen in our first generation students, um, this, this kind of resilience, this perseverance. A lot of our students, I mean, they arrive as kind of, well, these days we live in a technological culture. So they, they arrive as consumers of this culture and they realize that through STEM, they have a chance to actually contribute and make and not just consume. And so I think that, that curiosity, that drive helps them over some of the barriers. The barriers are largely, you know, that our, our America does not do a good job of preparing high school students for STEM. There is a semester or two or sometimes three of remediation in mathematics. That's the right now the, the, the toughest barrier to overcome. Part of STEM core, a big part of STEM core, is accelerating that pathway through, pre, through co-requisites. Instead of saying do, do A and before B before C, we're beginning to mix things up. So students are doing A and B at the same time with B as a motivation for completing A. And I think a big part of building those capacities is also building student confidence. That's it. Um, yes. and, and so, you know, that mm-hmm. definitely goes hand in hand um, mm-hmm. with that. And so um, how can people get in contact with you if they want to learn more? Yeah, so uh, 505-747-5424 is my phone number. And um, you can search for STEM Core on the, on the Northern page. And... Um, and Melanie Cordova on the on the northern page. And her contact info is on that page along with a lot more information. For sure. Yeah. Um, and, and if 
from time to time um, when there are presentations or, or tables on campus, we'll make those announcements for students. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you so much for, yeah. for joining us this morning. Um, and as we mentioned, you can learn more about STEM Corps by visiting our website at nnmc.edu and searching for STEM Corps. And thanks to Dr. Steve Cox, Professor of Engineering at Northern. As many of us know, March is Women's History Month, a time to recognize the countless contributions that women have made in our communities, in society, and in our own lives. Joining me to talk about Women's History Month this morning is Director of Northern's Office of Equity and Diversity, Dr. Patricia Trujillo. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm happy it's Women's History Month. Happy and you Women's know, History Month. Absolutely. Yeah. And what is Women's History Month, and how is it taking shape at Northern? Sure. Uh, Women's History Month, well, uh, in equity and diversity in our field uh, throughout colleges and universities across the nation. We designate different months and weeks to really highlight and celebrate the contributions of peoples who have um, historically dis been disenfranchised in higher ed. And so March has been designated as Women's History Month. It's kicked off by International Women's Day, which we just celebrated on Sunday. Um, and really what we're planning to organize at Northern is a celebration of the women of Northern. We have a lot of really fantastic, brilliant, um, powerful women who work at our college. Um, and sometimes um, we have gone outside of the college to bring people in. And this, this time around, we decided let's celebrate the voices of the women from our own college community. And I love that you're taking the lead on that as as a powerful woman at Northern. Oh, and yeah. so thank you for <laughs> thank you for doing that. And you know, I did read kind of some interesting history about uh, Women's History Month. It started out as uh, a day, you know, International Women's Day, and then they gave us a week. This yes. was in the '80s, and then finally we did get the whole month. So kind of like the story of women's progress, uh, incremental, but you know, eventually yes. we were able to, to achieve more. Well, and I'm, the underlying theory for all of the work we do at Equity and Diversity is that you know we highlight the month, but you really all year is Women's History Year. and <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Just like, you know, Native American, Black History, um, Hispanic History Month, and these are realities that we're living all the time. And absolutely. So, um, how is this year's Women's History Month different from those Northerns ha Northern has hosted in the past? Yeah, so what we're really trying to do is also create some good institutional habits um, uh, so that it's not just during Women's History Month that we're doing events, but that we can create some different formats for events that um, just become Come second nature. So we've organized around the concept of a Women's History Month coffee hour and also Women's History Month brown bags. Um, and the last uh, way, the other uh, methodology is that we're doing workshops, learning how to do something together, uh, especially when we think about the history of northern New Mexico and all the fierce Nuevo Mexicanas and the Pueblo women in our community, is that oftentimes, historically, when women would gather is when they were doing something together, right? So if that was husking corn, if that was, you know, tying ristras, if that was peeling chili, a lot of times, a lot of the intergenerational knowledge transmission was happening in those kinds of circles. And so really, uh, we're trying to pull that spirit in um, uh, from our area uh, to create these kinds of opportunities on campus. And I understand that there are several upcoming events that students, faculty, staff, and community members can participate in this month. Can you give us a rundown? Sure. Well, I'll highlight the one that we had yesterday, and then I'll move forward. But uh, Stephanie Montoya, our, our guest, I mean, our host here today, um, I was our host yesterday, and we did a really great gathering called The Women Who Inspire Us. And so people who have participated, and I really want to emphasize that Women's History Month activities are for women, for men, for non-binary folks. You know, we want to welcome everybody into this circle. And uh, so people brought either images of somebody from their family, um, some people in their fields. We heard great stories about the first uh, woman director, um, some great designers. And then we just went around the circle and shared and, you know, we laughed a lot. We listened to some music. And I think that everybody who participated left there, you know, um, feeling really inspired, uh, not just by the woman that they brought in to highlight, but by the the, the circle of women that surrounded us um, on that day. So Absolutely. That's, yeah. Thank you for that shout out. And that was really a, a great event just to see who everybody chose. And, yeah. you know, all the way from Dolly Parton and Emily Dickinson yeah. to our own grandmothers and great grandmothers and even nieces and yeah. so my babysitter my beloved babysitter Josie Trujillo right who took care of me uh, literally for through my entire childhood but who taught me how to run a farm right just by following in her shadow oftentimes you know my uh, uh, so I, for me I really feel that like you know I have this duality where um, I uh, 
am scholarly, right? I have the, uh, a PhD, but then I also um, have the other PhD, a post hole digger, uh, where I know how to work with my hands and know the power of a pala in our community. And so um, for me, I'm really blessed to have had women in my life who were role models in both of those areas. I, I really love that post hole digger. I've never heard that before. <laughs> and I, I, I'll give you credit, but I think I might have to steal that when I someday get my own PhD. <laughs> I, I credit Dr. Ana X. Gutierrez okay. Cisneros, who uh, kept a post hole, an actual post hole digger in her office until she received her PhD last yeah, year. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, you know, shout out to her. You know, yeah. she's a force at, at Northern as well and was, was just a named tenured professor. And uh, so Yeah, let's celebrate her. And that actually connects us to some of our upcoming events. Dr. Anna X will be presenting her research, her original research on the 23rd at the Española campus. Um, her uh, research topic is Riru in Rio Arriba, the implications of alternative sentencing requirements. So Dr. X is one of the principal investigators working with the county um, and working with the legal system in the area to help get um, people who have uh, drug offenses um, in the system. Um, rather than getting jail time, they're being rerouted to um, different kinds of treatment centers. Uh, and so what this really does is it decriminalizes um, people who are um, addicts, right, because addiction is a disease and it gives them a second chance. It gives them a different opportunity to not be uh, routed into the legal system and into jails. And so I know that's going to happen, um, I believe, the, the Monday or Tuesday after spring break? Yes. So Monday the 23rd, um, this is going to be a coffee hour. So it's an early morning important conversation, 830 to 930. And we will be um, hosting that in the NNMC Student Center. Okay, and that's adjacent to the event center yes. um, for those of you who are confused. And if you don't know where the event center is either, we'll have, um, you know, definitely someone who can direct you. But it's downstairs and signage. And, yeah. signage yeah. and that's also the big kickoff day to everything that's happening in El Rito. So we can just have a big celebration that starts on the Española campus and goes over to the El Rito campus. Absolutely. And I know that at the end of this week... Um, you know, today, obviously, live at Northern, we're talking about women's history. We had the event yesterday. Yes. Uh, tomorrow, I think there's a wellness walk, uh, 845 to 915, departing yes. from the rotunda. And then there's going to be another talk. Yeah. Um, our uh, BASO facilitator, Willie Williams, will be reading from her self-published book that's entitled Why Shouldn't I? Um, and that will be in the uh, student center from 12 to 115. That is a, a bring your own brown bag uh, kind of uh, situation. But we will hear from Willie um, uh, her personal story, uh, because something else that we really like to do during Women's History Month is celebrate this, the personal histories and stories of women and um, also learn from them, because there is the feminist adage that the personal is political. Um, and that when we start to empower ourselves in our lives, uh, right, we empower not only ourselves, but those that we surround um, ourselves with. So in Willie's case, she's raised six boys, her, uh, her own boys and her grand, uh, her grandsons. Um, and so she is also really funny. She shared some of her stand up comedy routine with us um, at our last Black History Month event. And so if you come, you're definitely going to uh, be entertained and learn a lot. And we've had her and, and a couple of her grandsons on the show before as well. And I know there are more events happening. Um, the events on the 25th, that, that's probably our more packed. Yeah, that's packed probably day. the most packed day. Yeah, and we can uh, we'll make sure and give you the website where you can uh, download this calendar. But on the twenty fifth, we're going to start with a Gay Straight Alliance coffee hour um, on campus. And our Gay Straight Alliance is a place where we create community um, to talk about issues with the LGBTQIA community. Um, and so uh, this time around, we're having a social. Sometimes we do have business meetings, but we're just trying to get this club off the ground again. It's been very active at different times. We kind of call it the club de vez en cuando, right? Like that it gets active uh, when we have the students and staff, faculty who are um, uh, uh, willing to carry it and, and need the space. Um, and so right now we have a very active bunch. So we would really love to open that space up to the community. Um, and then at lunch that day, uh, somebody from our communications office, Lisa Pelletier, will be doing a, a session called Female Creative Energy, Give It Face, Space, and Grace. And if anybody's familiar with uh, Lisa and her designing, um, she is just really talented and creative, a creative force. I always love working with her so much. And so I'm sure that that will be a great workshop. And then we're going to end the day um, helping us to get a little bit more organized. Uh, Nathana Bird, the assistant director of Tewa Women United, is going to be um, 
uh, hosting a session called Get Your Stuff Together. Uh, and that is really, um, uh, she's going to talk to us about the concept of passion planning. Um, and so passion planning is how we not only time manage for our work day, uh, according to what our institution wants for us, but how we also create space in our life to follow what we are also passionate about. So uh, in her case, that is, you know, advocacy and fierceness and in, in, in um, support of Tewa women. Um, but it can be anything else, right? I know that Nathana is also very artistic and lives a full life. And so she she really credits passion planning with being a part of that. And she's going to show us the, how to do that. And um, I just wanted to make sure that we get to this, uh, Dr. Trujillo. You have shared a corrido with us that captures a very important time here in New Mexico and in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, before we play it, can you give us some quick background? Sure. Um, so this Women's History Month 2020 is uh, also really special because we're marking a historic moment of 100 years of women having the right to vote in the United States. Um, and women's suffrage uh, was fought for for decades um, before it was granted in 1920. Uh, and oftentimes we think of women's suffrage as something that happened over there, uh, yeah, right, in, in, on the East Coast. But there were actually several New Mexican women who were key figures in women's suffrage in the West. Um, and so two of them uh, that I could name are Nina Otero Warren and Soledad Chavez Chacon. And the latter, um, Chacon, uh, is a really of interest in New Mexico history um, because she's considered the, one of the first, um, if not the first, uh, 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 female elected officials in the United States. She was our Secretary of State. And in 1924, right, just four years after um, suffrage was granted, uh, she was asked to be the acting governor of New Mexico. So even though she was not elected, um, she is credited with being the first Hispanic uh, female governor of the state of New Mexico. And uh, for me, I didn't know that until I was already in grad school. I found some of her files in the archives. And so I love that more and more people are finding out about her. And so I would just uh, direct people to an article called A Centennial Glimpse into New Mexico Suffrage Movement through El Corrido de la Votación by um, Carmela Scorcia Pacheco. And that's where um, the corrido that we're about to listen to is highlighted. Uh, corridos, of course, are uh, not just a song, but also a historic, a way that our communities would uh, share events and, and share history. And so at the time, uh, this corrido about uh, suffrage and voting rights for women was written. And so I know that we have it queued up. Um, this is El Corrido de la Votación by Kirina Córdoba de Medina. Año de 1844 al entrar. Se concede a las mujeres el derecho de votar. El gobierno americano, por tener sabiduría, les concede a las mujeres derecho a su idananía. Ya se juntan las mujeres, se ponen a platicar. Comadrita oh, de mi vida, la elección se va a probar. Ya se juntan las mujeres, hacen un club de señoras. Cambian sus candidatas, también para gobernadora. Ya se juntan las mujeres, se ponen a platicar. Ya abandonan sus quehaceres, ellas se van a votar. Amigas que me reflejan, todos los que están casados, y ahora ni se quejan, y al gobierno de los estados. El día de las elecciones, todos los hombres se unieron, deber votar las mujeres, que llamaban la atención. Ya quieren manejar los trenes y también las oficinas. Y que que se quede el marido gobernando la cocina. El gobierno del estado 
trabajo una nueva ley. De quedarse gobernado cada hombre por su mujer. Reciban sus oficinas, secretarias, juez de paz. Cambien sus candidatas y suspiran para demás. ¿Y acaso van a la guerra formadas en batallón? ¿Para qué quieren maderita que de gancho de pantalón? Wonderful. And we'll post the article, which includes a translation for that corrido, and you can listen to it again um, on our Facebook page. And I know we are running a little short on time because we had so many great segments today, um, but I would invite everyone to participate, of course, in the in the Women's History Month events, which we post the full calendar on our website and on our social media. Um, and if someone wants to learn more or get involved, how can they contact you? Sure. Um, so we also have it posted on the Equity and Diversity Facebook page, which is facebook.com backslash N-N-M-C-O-E-D. Um, you can leave us a comment there. Um, you can download the calendar there, or you can call at 505-747-5448. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Patricia Trujillo, Director of the Office of Equity and Diversity at Northern New Mexico College on Women's History Month. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, well, because we are running a little short on time, we're just going to go ahead and move our giveaway to our Facebook page. Um, we'll go ahead and give away another one of those Española uh, Culture Enya t-shirts designed um, for Northern. And so we will uh, move that to Facebook and just comment on the Facebook post for Live at Northern and tell us um, the year that the vote for women was passed. And that will be our trivia question for today. Uh, just some quick news and announcements. NNMC Student Life uh, and Student Senate are providing free snacks this week to fuel students studying for midterms. Coffee and morning snacks are available in the Student Success Center next to the Event Center from 9 a.m. to noon. And evening snacks are available from 4 to 7 p.m. Good luck on midterms. And as we mentioned, Northern's Office of Equity and Diversity is sponsoring events all month long for Women's History Month. This Thursday, March 12th, they will host a women's wellness walk from 845 to 915, departing from the NNMC Rotunda and a brown bag lunch session from noon to 115 p.m. in the student space next to the NNMC Event Center, featuring a reading by Willie Williams from her book, Why Shouldn't I? More events are scheduled after spring break, so be sure to check our website and social media for the full calendar of events. Representatives from the Pajarito Environmental Education Center will host a talk this Friday, March 13th about STEM careers at 12.30 p.m. in Classroom GE 105. And spring break is next week, so no classes, uh, but the college will be open for the week, so it's a good time to take care of business, such as completing your FAFSA, or if you need to pick up an extra class, some eight-week options are available starting after spring break. Spring hours for the spring break hours for the gym are Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And Española Cafe Scientifique will host a talk for youth and teens on portable nuclear reactors, power for our planet and beyond, on Wednesday, March 18th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. in the NNMC Event Center. Contact 423-1426 for more details. That's our show for today, but we'll be back on Wednesday, March 25th with more from your Northern New Mexico College. In the meantime, you can find more news and events from us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Northern New Mexico College. Follow us on Instagram and on Twitter at Northern NNMC. Also visit our website at nnmc.edu or call 747-2111. Thanks for listening, and we wish you all a happy and safe couple of weeks. Gracias. <laughs> Española, Santa Fe Taos, 9.50 a.m. and 100.7 FM. KDCE Radio, news on the hour.